panel and your name appears up here to my immediate right or left, if you would make your way up here, we would appreciate it, please. Just so you know, Mark, Gary, Wait. Just so you know, they have given me 104 questions. We will not make it through. We are going to go through the order in which they gave them to me. There's 104 questions. That is. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Did you enjoy that longer break? Yes. Okay. We are going to spend some time now doing a Q&A with the panel members who have presented today. What will happen is the questions that have been submitted, and I will tell you that I have over 104 written questions up here. There are approximately 250 more in the CMS room, so you all have done an extraordinarily good job. All of those that are answered here will be put up on the website in addition to those that are not answered here today and tomorrow. So if your question is not one that was um, answered today, please be rest assured that your question is very important to us, and we want to be sure um, that it is answered in the future. What happened with the questions that were submitted today, a team of CMS staff personnel went through and looked at all the duplicates where we had duplicates and then came up with the questions. So that is how we will take this process. I'd like to introduce the panel. To my immediate left is Mark Hamelberg. Next to Mark is Jim Mayhew. And next to Jim is Carol Gilbo. To my immediate right is Patricia Ambrose. To her right is David Gardner. To his right is John Albert, and to his right is a new face up here today, and that's uh, Gary Calabrese. They will be answering the questions. If the question was directed to a specific person, that person will answer it. Otherwise, all of these people wear wonderful hats, and they are interchangeable, so whichever person up here wants to answer it will answer the question. The first question is, Will members, parentheses, retirees, be allowed to call the RDS Center? Will members, parentheses, retirees, be allowed to call the RDS Center? 
I think I should answer that question. Retirees will actually be calling 1-800-MEDICARE. That is totally dedicated to answering any beneficiary question. And just to add to that, um, if, a, if a beneficiary is uh, by some chance uh, calling in on the RDS helpline, we will have a facility there in the IVR to, to help uh, redirect them to 1-800-MEDICARE. So uh, the RDS center help helpline is not staffed to handle, you know, 40 million phone calls. <laughs> so, uh, but 1-800-MEDICARE allegedly is, so. <laughs> How many employees will be working the customer service lines? How many employees will be working the customer service lines? Well, as many reps as we need to handle all of the questions. Of course, it's a new program, and probably with our website being so available and being informational, we really don't anticipate a lot of calls, but we will be there to help you. What did you just say? <laughs> Would you like to repeat that? <laughs> I got it, I think. Greater than one. Greater than one. Good. Okay. If we aggregate plans for net test, can the same actuary who did the gross test attestation also do the net test attestation? If we aggregate plans for net test, can the same actuary who did the gross test attestation also do the net test attestation? Uh, the answer is uh, absolutely. It, um, the plan sponsor can have the same actuary do both the gross and the net test, uh, even in the instance where they're aggregating the net test, uh, several options within the net test. Thank you. How quickly after a monthly submission to the RDS website will the response file be available? If you submit sub subsidiary data through the USDA, is that, it's not US. Subsidy data? Yeah. Through the VDSA, I think is what. I was going to make a joke How about mad cow disease, but I decided to. To the USDA. Not. Now, as you can see, my challenge is being able to decipher everyone's handwriting. So uh, if that brings a smile to your face, that's a good thing. On a monthly basis, how quickly will the response? file be provided? Currently or quarterly exchange? You must adhere to a 45-day response. How quickly after a monthly submission to the RDS website will the response file be available? If you submit subsidy data through the VDSA on a monthly basis, how quickly will the response file be provided? Currently or quarterly exchange? It must be adhered to in a 45-day response. Well, I mean, for the, for the VDSA, the only, the only delay that would occur might be a day or two as, we, as the data is passed back through the COB contractor to the employer submitting that data. But essentially, uh, you know, if you have multiple RDS IDs that you submit through your VDSA, uh, RDS will, will basically return those to, the, to us as they process each one of those IDs and we will get them back to you. Uh, so, you know, whatever time frame they, that they have on their end, add maybe a couple of days at most to do the work that we need on our end if we have to capture any of that data for uh, subsidy reporting uh, records. But we're looking at turning around the, the, the N and D records as part of that non-MSP file within a few days. Thank you. Can we submit some records using the Social Security numbers and others using the HICN, or do we have to use Social Security numbers for all records or HICN for all records? Can we submit some records using Social Security numbers and others using the HICN, or do we have to use Social Security numbers for all records or HICN for all records? You actually have your choice. Um, by, in your retiree file submission, 
some of your retirees could be submitted with the Social Security number and others with the HIC number. As long as we have one or the other per record, that's fine. What will happen if we have an individual covered under our prescription plan, but the individual has coverage with another employer? What will happen if we have an individual covered under our prescription plan, but the individual has coverage with another employer? Good question. Uh, that's going to really depend on the different, the different scenarios I could fall under. For instance, you could have a participant in your plan who's retired and, uh, and uh, Medicare eligible, and you can collect a subsidy um, for, for that person, and that person may have a spouse who's also Medicare eligible, but that spouse uh, have an active plan with her, her employer. Well, under the MSP rules, uh, the spouse's active plan uh, would be primary, and then your plan would be secondary, and you could still perhaps collect the subsidy for the cost incurred under your plan for the, for the spouse. Um, so there are different scenarios uh, which you could, uh, a spouse or a dependent could have two coverages and you could still collect the subsidy. If I could just add on to that, of course, you can't get subsidy payments on the same expense, two different employers over the same expense. And in a case like what Jim just described, if, um, if your plan is secondary to somebody else, you may not have actually very much incurred costs, but to the extent that you do and you otherwise comply with the other rules, you can get subsidy payments to reflect the costs incurred. And again, just to add to that, of course, the thresholds and the limits would apply too, so it's even less likely that there would right. be remaining residual cost. Okay. Does the non-MSP file for the VDSA need to be submitted monthly, or can it still be sent on a quarterly basis like the MSP file? Does the non-MSP file for VDSA need to be submitted monthly, or can it still be sent on a quarterly basis like the MSP file? It's, it's your choice. Flexibility. <laughs> and there are, there are certain ramifications to that. If you, are, if you are interested in getting the more rapid feedback from uh, the RDS center, uh, then you can certainly submit as frequently as, as monthly. Well, one advantage to monthly, again, is you know, with the VDSA process, I should have mentioned this with the previous question, is that you know, we're going to be populating that RDS response with the Medicare entitlement information uh, if it exists, so that's part of that several day turnaround time on our, our end is to populate those subsidy records even if they're accepted by RDS with Medicare, you know, A and B entitlement, uh, entitlement information. So. Okay. When CMS sends notification that they are rejecting certain enrollees, who gets the notification? The AR, AM, or other designee? When CMS sends notification that they are rejecting certain enrollees, who gets the notification, the AR, AM, or other designee? I'll answer that question. Um, first off, the file is transmitted back. Um, the, the notification file is transmitted in the same fashion or um, way that you submitted your retiree files. So if it was uploaded, if, if you're submitting your retiree files to the website, um, uploading to the website, then we will post your notification file there. Um, like, and, and multiple people, the uh, authorized rep, the account manager, and designees who are, um, have permissions to interact with the file transfer process are able to view those notifications. And all of them will receive an email. If you're um, re sending, transmitting your retiree files mainframe to mainframe or via VDSA, um, the file goes to one place, and it's most likely going to be one of your technical resources who's picking up that file and producing a report for you or something along those lines. But the email that goes out from the RDS Center to let you know that the file was sent goes to all of those individuals, users of the website, the authorized rep, the account manager, and the designees. However, that email does not have 
any um, detail information in it about a particular retiree. It's just a notification or a, an alert that a notification file is being sent. How does the AR select the AM, quote, outside of the RDS system, end quote? I did not hear you describe the procedure. How does the AR select the AM, quote, outside of the RDS system, end quote? I did not hear you describe the procedure. Well, since it's outside of the RDS environment, there's no procedure. But uh, it's, it's uh, again, this is the, uh, the, the flexibility. A plan sponsor has uh, the right to um, enter into an arrangement with uh, consultants or benefit administrators or anyone who, who they feel would best act on their behalf. Uh, so that is, uh, again, outside the RDS center system. Uh, and the first time uh, the interaction happens with the RDS center is when that account manager, after they've had the conversation and have the business arrangement established, uh, that account manager would come in and uh, register onto the website and introduce themselves and then link themselves to that authorized rep. For retirees with multiple records coming back due to breaks in eligibility, do we to continue to submit their file even though they may not be eligible, or do we have to wait for you to notify us to resubmit? For retirees with multiple records coming back due to breaks in eligibility, do we continue to submit their file even though they may not be eligible, or do we have to wait for you to notify us to resubmit? Well, actually, if we've responded back with um, two periods of subsidy coverage, you don't need to resubmit that retiree on your monthly update unless there's some change that you're aware of um, that you would like to notify the RDS center about. So we'll send you back um, two response records to, or multiple response records to show start and end dates for various subsidy periods for which you may claim the subsidy for this retiree, but unless you know of a change, there's no need to send another record. Um, what, what, if, um, what if that most recent period, though, was a period of Part D entitlement to enrollment, though? You know, that they now know at the most recent time, the current time that the person has Part D, maybe that's what they're asking. Do you want to? You know? I'm not sure I understand. You send back, you send back two records. The guy has subsidy for a certain period of time, but the most, uh, but like say the past couple of months, he doesn't because he, he enrolled in Part D. Maybe that's what they're asking: is do they resubmit them a quarter later? They have to wait to hear from you that the guy no longer has Part D. What our intent is is that they wait to hear from us okay. that um, there's been a change in their Part D enrollment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John, for okay. that. Yeah, that would be a redundant record if it were to come back, and it really would would not add any value to our system. And so, unless you know of a change, there's no, no reason to send us an, uh, a new update file, or update record, excuse me. Can you edit information once the continue button has been submitted and or clicked? Is there any information that cannot be edited once submitted? Can you edit information once the continue button has been submitted or, and or clicked? Is there any information that cannot be edited once submitted? Uh, you will be able to edit every page of your application prior to signing the plan sponsor agreement. Um, I want to clarify um, kind of the, the button notation. Um, continue is um, generally a action that you take when you've completed that page and you wish to go on to the next one or back to your application status page. Um, there will be a, an actual submit button for the um, plan sponsor to um, well, it's really a, a, a sign button, but he is submitting his um, signature. Um, so I don't want to get that confused, but as you say you're an account manager going page by page, um, you can uh, complete, say, your electronic fund transfer information, and then if, as long as your um, authorized rep has not submitted the, signed the plan sponsor agreement and submitted the application, you can go back to that page and change it the next day. Um, or on an, another session um, on the website. And if you, if you need to change the information after you submit it, again, there's always the withdraw application option. If you know that incorrect information or uh, new information before the final application has been uh, processed and approved and or rejected, you have the ability to withdraw that back if you need to. 
How do we make sure retirees do not sign up for Part D? Can we tell them not to sign up for Part D? How do we make sure retirees do not sign up for Part D? Can we tell them not to sign up for Part D? Uh, the answer is, no, you cannot prevent a retiree from signing up for Part D. The retiree, in all instances, must have the choice to, to enroll in Part D. What a plan sponsor can do is educate their retirees as to the value of the, the employer's benefit, the sponsor's benefit, and then the value of the Part D, and provide enough information to the retiree for them to make an educated choice as to what benefit is best for them. In order to designate an individual to have access to all the secure website features and response files, do we check that they have access to Part 6 retiree list submission? In order to designate an individual to have access to all the secure website features and response files, do we check that they have access to Part 6 retiree list submission? Yes, that's actually the, I, I presume we're talking about the page where you're designating or um, naming a designee for your application. And in, in order for them to be able to um, uh, view the response file and retiree lists, that would be the, um, the place where you would indicate that. Yeah, and that's true about any of the other sets of functionality too, such as you know, submitting an appeal or uh, ultimately sending payment requests as well or dealing with the payment information. All of those items are, are listed or will be listed on that screen when you assign a designee's authority. So uh, checking the box next to that authority is making an affirmative statement that this, this person is authorized based on my knowledge. Uh, on their knowledge, uh, whoever's doing it, um, that person does have the ability to, to do those functions. Okay. We have one health plan with one level of benefits for retirees. Different groups of retirees pay different rates for coverage depending on union, length of service, et cetera. Would we file one application or multiple? We have one health plan with one level of benefits for retirees. Different groups of retirees pay different rates for coverage depending on union, length of service, et cetera. Would we file one application or multiple? Um, you know, it really boils down to uh, how the sponsor administers the benefit. Uh, it's down uh, from the, just a few facts that are presented that um, the sponsor could conceivably call this one plan with the different uh, retiree contributions being different benefit options under the plan, and they could conceivably file one application for the whole plan and then se segregate out the benefit options for the gross test. But again, um, it really boils down to how the sponsor administers the benefits uh, uh, for. Uh, COBRA purposes and other purposes. And just a quick add-on, of course, we mentioned earlier the uh, start and end dates for the plan benefit year for all of those options would also have to be the same in order for those uh, options to be aggregated under one application. If the application has been filed prior to September 30th, 2005 and is not yet approved or denied and it is getting close to September 30th, 2005, Will the applicant need to request an extension or is an extension needed? If the application has been filed prior to September 30th, 2005 and is not yet approved or denied and it is getting close to September 30th, 2005, will the applicant need to request an extension or is an extension needed? The answer to that is no. Um, the only time you would um, need to request an extension is if you we're fearful that, that the authorized rep or whatever your internal processes were, were not going to be completed uh, by, that, by that cutoff date and time period. Um, so it, it really is, do you need more time for the authorized rep or other designees or the account manager to finish that application? Uh, that's, that's really the driver. It's not, once it's submitted, uh, it's considered you know, received by the RDS Center and it's timely. 
How long does the validation process take? Will your user ID password expire, and if so, when? How long does the validation process take? Will your user ID password expire, if so, when? I guess I'll take this one. Um, we have a service level agreement to process the application once submitted within 15 business days. Um, so, it, and it should take far less than that. Um, sometimes the EFT process can take a little bit longer than a, a day or two. Um, the retiree file processing should really be a couple of days turnaround for that. Um, so we're really expecting, now of course the program hasn't been started yet, so um, we're really expecting to turn around the applications in less than, than that SLA. Um, your password will expire every 60 days as prescribed by CMS rules. Um, so if you haven't been out on the website and you come back and you log in with an expired password, you'll be prompted immediately to change that password and um, to, in order to continue on um, working in the secure website. If the plan year begins after January 1, 2006, for example, March 1, 2006, is the deadline this year still September 30th, or is it later? If the plan year begins after January 1, 2006, for example, March 1, 2006, is the deadline this year still September 30th, or is it later? Um, the deadline, uh, if let's say the plan year starts March 1st, uh, the deadline to get uh, potential retiree drug subsidy benefit for January and February of 2006 would still be September 30th, 2005, with an opportunity for a 30-day extension. The deadline for the plan year to end 2007, that would be a run from March 1st, 2006 through February 28th, 2007, would be 30 day, uh, at least 90 days before March 1st, which would be backtracking 90 days, I believe, by November 30th of 2005. If we need to update other roles for new people assuming those positions mid-year, how is this accomplished? If we need to update other roles for new people assuming those positions mid-year, how is this accomplished? You will be able to go in and change the designees on your application after it's been submitted and approved. So you could replace, for example, your authorized rep, you could replace your account manager um, you can replace your designees, um, and, and there will be a, a facility or a feature on the website for you to go in and change your designees to essentially expire ones that are no longer working or associated on, with your application and add a new designee. For example, someone who might be taking over responsibilities for uploading your file and downloading the response file. There can only be one account manager and one authorized rep at a given time uh, authorized in the system. So as Pat said, uh, if you needed to change those individuals, they would, there would not be two individuals active at any one point. They would be a true replace. Is information given on the call center line guaranteed? <laughs> Wait to hear part B. Can we rely and act on the information? Is information given on the call center line guaranteed, and can we rely and act on that information? Um, yes. I definitely believe and know that you can act on that information. The RDS helpline has been given all the information through CMS guidance, and we're there to only provide the information that we have gotten thoroughly approved. As the program evolves, our information will be updated. And to add to that, uh, I definitely agree. Um, as, as more decisions are made with how this program is going to be implemented, we, we will be updating the knowledge base that our CSRs have. Uh, but an important distinction needs to be understood, and that is that there are questions that should be directed to CMS, and there are questions that should be directed to the RDS Center. And I believe we touched on that today in the customer service presentation. 
questions pertaining to laws, regulations, or how CMS has decided to implement those uh, from a policy perspective absolutely must go to CMS. Uh, for those routine operational questions that we've, you know, issues we've talked about here with the use of the website, submitting an application, tomorrow we'll be talking about uh, proposed payment processes. Uh, as decisions are made, CSRs are trained. So to the extent that, that uh, your information needs are operational and focus, then the RDS Center Helpline should help. In reference to the sub subsidy applications, we need guidance on what is the prescription group number. We have carved out prescription benefits for multiple carriers, and we are confused what is this number, since everyone has different numbers depending on the medical carrier. In reference to the subsidy applications, we need guidance on what is the prescription group number. We have carved out prescription drug benefits for multiple carriers, and we are confused what is this number, since everyone has different numbers depending on medical carriers. Uh, I, what we're asking for is that number. Um, I think there was some confusion that we were creating a new group number or our uh, prescription drug group number. We intend, intended to use the existing group numbers that you're already using. So if you have, for your benefit option, under a particular insurance carrier, a group number, that's exactly what we want you to submit on your retiree file and exactly how we want you to set up your benefit option on the application. To the extent, to the extent it identifies truly a unique benefit option under your plan. But there are, we did find there were some instance, instances where the um, RX group number was not specific enough to actually identify uh, a, a specific benefit option under the plan. So that was feedback we got in the um, Paperwork Reduction Act notice, and uh, we are trying to leverage, whenever possible, existing uh, data that's already captured in the pharmacy network processing system with respect to, to drug claims. So uh, that term is something that you'll find, for example, on an NCPDP transaction. So um, that's what we meant by the RX group number. I hope that answers the question. Okay. What will be posted on the Employers Group Secure section of the RDS website after CMS receives the detailed utilization data from the health plan? Will there be aggregate information regarding the Employer Group subsidy payment? What will be posted on the Employer Group's Secure section of the RSD website after CMS receives the detailed utilization data from the health plan? Will there be aggregate information regarding the employer group subsidy payment? We'll be talking about this uh, more specifically tomorrow when we have uh, our payment, our proposed payment methodology presentations and Q's and A's. So it may be best to, to, to save the answer until then, but uh, we are anticipating to have information about payments that we make to your bank account, summaries of those payments or uh, uh, payment notices on the account uh, for the appropriate personnel who have been authorized by the account manager or the authorized rep to view payment related information. So there will be those, uh, those receipts out there. Um, and in terms of specific retiree data, um, at this point uh, our processes are still being defined. Uh, my guess is it probably will not be out there, specific retiree uh, data. So um, those will only be passed back and forth with reconciliation data files. Again, uh, I'd like to table the rest of this answer until tomorrow. On a self-fund plan, if we do not have a group number, must our prescription carrier provide one? On a self-fund plan, if we do not have a group number, must our prescription carrier provide one? So we're actually allowing you the flexibility to make up your own group number. It's, we're calling it now the unique benefit option identifier. So as you're filling out your application for that particular benefit option, um, you may make up your own identifier that is meaningful to you as long as you use that same number on your application and your retiree list that you submit for each of your retirees. We need a unique uh, benefit option identifier uh, associated with every single uh, retiree uh, for the purposes of knowing and be able, being able to track or, and having knowledge in our database that this particular retiree 
on this day during your benefit year was covered under this specific benefit option under your plans. If that changes throughout the course of the year, uh, the purpose of the, of the retiree list data sharing and update files is so that we have the most recent information about that retiree and you have the most recent information about our feedback about that retiree. At reconciliation, it becomes very important for us to be able to know which, uh, which what we're calling benefit option administrator uh, would need to submit information on that retiree's uh, drug costs. So if, if a retiree moves across plans, or moves, excuse me, move, moves across benefit options throughout the course of the year, um, we'll have that audit trail and at reconciliation we'll be able to marry the two, both the, pay, the drug costs that were paid and that eligibility period uh, to the benefit option. So that, that unique identifier is very important to make sure that that link happens uh, in the appropriate way at reconciliation. We have concerns that we have correct Social Security numbers for spouses. What impact will incorrect Social Security numbers have on our subsidy application? We have concerns that we have correct Social Security numbers for spouses. What impact will incorrect Social Security numbers have on our subsidy application? If, uh, if there is not a valid Social Security number, in other words, you provide to us a Social Security number, and then we, in our uh, batch file, uh, query that we do against our Medicare beneficiary database. If we do not get a hit, um, then that retiree will be rejected, the spouse will be rejected uh, for the purposes of claiming subsidy. And uh, just to give John Albert a chance to, to speak up here, well, um, the VDSA the process, question. the VDSA process works that same way, but uh, you do have the ability to query uh, individuals. If you are, if you, you have to have a right, you have to have a valid number, but you, that's another process for which you can check. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, if you want to, uh, if I mean, if you want to, just find out if they have Medicare, and you, you know, submit that as a, a query, or even through like Basis, for example. I mean, and if they're not found, it's you know most likely you know either they just don't have Medicare, or they uh, the the Social Security number provided didn't match up to those personal identifying characteristics of the name, date of birth, and sex, et cetera. We do take it one step further, and that is that. Medicare maintains a cross-reference file of Social Security numbers to health insurance claim numbers, the Medicare number. And it is possible over the course of time that someone's Social Security number could change or their health insurance claim number could change. If you send in a valid uh, name, Social Security number uh, combination, and we find, uh, we, we search our records to make sure uh, that there wasn't, it's not just not the latest and greatest version of that number. So we have that, that historical cross-reference. So even if you don't have the most current Social Security number or the most current health insurance claim number, uh, we should get a match on our, on our uh, system through that cross-reference. How can we verify that an actuary is a AAA member in good standing? How can we verify that an actuary is a AAA member in good standing? Um, it, as I uh, indicated this morning, uh, CMS is working with the American Academy of Actuaries to um, assign membership numbers to the actuaries who are going to be uh, participating in the RDS application process. And it's my understanding that the American Academy of Actuaries will have a list of the actuaries along with the membership numbers on the uh, website and you can certainly uh, validate that uh, by going to the American Academy of Actuaries website or you can even call the American Academy of Actuaries directly and get the verification of, of their membership. What is an HIC number and who would have this number? What is an HIC number and who would have this number? The health insurance claim number is the number that Medicare assigns to individuals to uniquely identify them to our, to our systems. I mean, yeah, sure. um, just to kind of, this kind of relates to the, pre, more the, the, not the previous, but the one before that question that if, you know, where you may not have a correct social security number, but if you do have both a HICN and, or a health insurance claim number and an SSN, I would assume under RDS you would encourage them to submit both just in case one of them is incorrect? That's correct. Okay, because that's, 
the same with the VDSA process, sometimes through a keystroke error or whatnot, the social security number may be off a digit. And then if that's the only number we get, we're not going to find them. But if you have, happen to have a health insurance claim number, we encourage you to submit that as well because we will find them through one of those two numbers if one of them is correct. It just increases your odds of having a match. And is it, is it true under the VDSA process, though, that if they submit just a social security number on their record, that they will uh, get a valid health insurance claim yeah. number returned to them? Yeah, that's one, one of the data elements that, that we do provide back on the VDSA response where, where we do find Medicare uh, entitlement. We actually provide you with that Medicare health insurance claim number so that on future submissions to update those records that you provide that HIC number or HIC number back to us, which basically speeds up our, our ability to find that person when processing the file. For the monthly reporting of retirees, how do we count retirees who come back to work for us from one to 11 months during a plan year, recognizing that they will be primary with Medicare for some months and employer primary for others? For the monthly reporting of retirees, how do we count retirees who come back to work for us from one to 11 months during a plan year, recognizing that they will be primary with Medicare for some months and employer primary for others? Well, I mean, that, that, those would be submitted as unique records, essentially through a VDSA process, just like with the RDS process, you're, you're kind of building unique periods of, of you know, for either subsidy or for Medicare secondary payer purposes. So for example, somebody wanted to submit uh, historical data over a period of a year on a VDSA file, uh, you know, they're new to the program and want to basically get us caught up to uh, where that person is. They would submit two separate records. One would be on the, the MSP file for that 11 months where they were working, and it would have a start date of, say, January 1 uh, of 2004 and a stop date of November 2004 and then would submit a second record probably claiming subsidy if they're now retired. They would submit an S record with that period reflected uh, when they were not working. Right. I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, but in the, if you're not using a VDSA process under the RDS Secure website file transmission method, uh, you would initially have that person on your retiree list at the beginning, assuming that they were on that, on that, um, in that plan at the beginning of the year. Uh, and then transition, say, in February, so if it was a calendar year. Um, that would come in on the initial retiree list uh, with the application, and then we would expect um, an update record showing a termination date um, that that person is no longer covered as a retiree under that plan. I, it, I guess that's assuming that there's not a shift in, uh, or there is a shift in plans. No, I, and then if, if they fall, uh, if they return to a retirement status, then um, I would recommend you send an ad record for that new period of, you know, subsidy coverage. On the, fi on the eligibility file submitted to CMS, is it necessary to state what plan option the eligible member has? On the eligibility file submitted to CMS, is it necessary to state what plan option the eligible member has? Yeah, I think we've already answered that question. The answer is yes. <laughs> Regarding actuarial attestation, is it required? Previous documents had indicated that an organization could perform certain criteria without use of an actuary. In regards to actuarial attestation, is it required? Previous documents had indicated that an organization could perform certain criteria without the use of an actuary. Uh, I'll take a crack at that. I'll give the others a break for a second. Uh, the short answer is if you're applying for the subsidy, you must have a qualified actuary that signs off on the attestation. Now, we have provided some guidance that enables actuaries to use some simplified methods that may simplify their calculations and their processes for arriving at their decision. But the actuary still must sign off on the attestation as a condition of it being submitted to us. And that, that's something that the statute essentially requires. It's not something that we would have the ability to change even if we wish to do it. 
Uh, all I can think of is that there may have been, uh, the question may be getting at situations where employers, <coughs> excuse me, are not applying for the subsidy. And the question is, what must they do in, in determining whether their coverage is creditable or not? And we did provide some separate guidance that said that in that there isn't a statutory obligation that you have a qualified actuary sign off and attest to the value of your coverage. And we gave guidance in, that tried to describe situations in which you may not need any actuary at all. In other places, you may be able to use an actuary, but we don't have the same attestation obligation. I, I hope that makes some sense. But in the context of the subsidy, which is obviously what we're talking about here, actuarial attestation is required in all cases. And, and that actuary would need to come to the RDS website to do that attestation submission. Can the AR and the AM see each other's personal information, for example, Social Security number, date of birth, et cetera, or designees? Can the AR and the AM see each other's personal information, for example, Social Security number, date of birth, et cetera, or designees? No, absolutely not. Um, only that particular individual may see his own personal information. Um, in fact, um, we're talking about not um, even allowing a, a change in certain personal information that should really never change, such as date of birth and so on, once you've been authenticated. But we're still talking through that process, certainly mailing address and that. But, um, you will, as an authorized rep, be able to see enough information to identify the individuals who are working on your application, but you will not be able to see their social security number or date of birth. Please clarify the benefit option administrator, confused about the need for this user and role. Please clarify the benefit optimum option administrator, confused about the need for this user and role. We'll likely talk a little bit about this tomorrow when we begin discussing uh, our proposed payment processes. Um, the thinking at this point is that, uh, and again, I'll qualify my answer by saying it's still, it's still an open issue because uh, we're still building the payment modules uh, for the system and we'll be doing that uh, for a couple, uh, couple months at this point. But the benefit option administrator is would be an individual that would be sending information uh, primarily about the costs uh, for the qualified covered retirees. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's not clear at this point to us, because we're still building that sp specific functionality in the system, if that individual would just be another type of designee with a separate uh, set of authorities uh, versus this you know, benefit option administrator role. So we realize that's a little bit confusing, and we will be clarifying this uh, in the coming uh, month or two. So stay tuned for a little bit more on that. We will touch a little bit more on what uh, the information would be uh, submitted by that individual, whatever their title, uh, tomorrow when we talk about payment. When we called the VDSA COB contractor, we were told no new applications will be taken for the VDSA until November. Is this correct? When we called the VDSA COB contractor, we were told no new applications will be taken for VDSA until November. Is this correct? No, that's not correct. Uh, the new agreements will be out on the street August 1st of this year. That's also when we will begin testing the new processes. I think the, the November date is the, the date of actual full production of the VDSA process, including the MSP and new non-MSP files. We will, as I mentioned earlier, they'll be accepting uh, the subsidy records uh, September 1st of this year, but the, uh, the actual live production date for the VDSA is, is November, but we are signing new agreements starting August 1st. Regarding the uploading of data, does the CMS system use IBM MQ series? Does the secure file upload use 128 or 256 encryptions? Regarding the uploading of data, does the CMS system use IBM MQ series, and does the secure file upload use 128 or 256 encryptions? 
We do, in fact, use IBM MQ series. It's one of the CMS um, architect architectural standards that we have to adhere to, along with a lot of other um, protocols and processes. Um, we use 128-bit encryption for the file upload process. With all the employers in the country and the number of appropriate AR, ARs, AMs, designees, and actuaries that will utilize the website, are you prepared for the inevitable volume of phone calls, emails, and overall website volume? Many of the instructions, file formats, et cetera, are just now available, and there will be confusion since some deadlines are tight and unyielding. Employers and insurers have not had 100 business days thus far to deliver everything, and time constraints will create extra pressure, thus more questions. Will the employers in the country, and the, with all the employers in the country, and the number of appropriate ARs, AMs, designees, and actuaries that will utilize the website, are you prepared for the inv inevitable volume of phone calls, emails, and overall website volume. Many of the instructions, file formats, et cetera, are just now available, and there will be confusion since deadlines are tight and unyielding. Employers and insurers have not had 100 business days thus far to deliver th uh, through everything, and time constraints will create extra pressure, thus more questions. Before anyone else answers, I think I'll just jump in, and then they'll all answer consistently with what I'm about to say. <laughs> the answer to that is yes, <laughs> we are prepared because success is the only option and, and we will be successful in implementing and we will have whatever resources are necessary to answer everybody's questions so that everybody will be prepared to successfully apply for the subsidy. With that said, I'll let others chime in with whatever else they want to say. Where's that hard hat? <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more, Mike. Uh, just to add to that, we, in, in building the system, part of establishing the data center and planning for uh, the various permutations of what could happen with respect to how a, uh, a plant sponsor will interact with our secure website, uh, we, we did go through uh, analysis about what we anticipate in terms of website hits, uh, things like that. So we have considered that. Um, and in terms of, uh, from a customer service perspective, we do have some internal contingency planning uh, with the RDS Center to shift resources as necessary uh, at our customer service department to uh, accommodate uh, more phone calls if possible if there is a surge. So we have thought about those things um, and uh, I'm told resources are available. So. I guess I'm to comment here. In, in fact, yes, we are continually um, training and bringing new staff members on to be ready for all calls that we expect to get starting August 1st. This has been a valuable session. What arrangements have been made for other sessions for those that were not able to attend? This has been a valuable session. What arrangements have been made for others who have not been able to attend? Uh, as you can probably tell, we've had uh, video cameras uh, running the whole time here today. Uh, I know I'm very aware of it. <laughs> uh, we will be making uh, the materials available on digital media uh, in the coming weeks, and I'm not sure if I know the exact details of when that's supposed to be available. I know, uh, a member of our, of our staff uh, has that information, and hopefully we can maybe get that information for tomorrow and share that. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact date and time that will be available. But we are planning on making that available. Uh, and I think it is, I'm not sure if it's for purchase or free. We'll, we'll double check on that. But it, it should have been, uh, I think, mentioned in the conference materials. If not, we'll, we'll clarify tomorrow. It was discussed earlier today, and I know they're trying to find the date. Okay. Kathy is working on it, so okay. I think we'll try. Right. Just, just to supplement that, we are going to make that information available as quickly as we can. We do not have plans at this time for any additional live conferences like this although I'm sure that we will continue to um, engage in the sort of uh, other types of outreach events that we've been engaging in. Uh, and as many of you have heard a number of us speak repeatedly about this over the uh, past uh, 8, 10, 12 months. 
So uh, we'll continue our outreach in that way, and, and of course, um, many of you know how to reach us, and we're still available for individual questions as they come up. But um, this, this at, at this point, I don't expect, given the uh, where we are and the fact that the um, uh, that, that the application is going to go live August one, and it where we are in July, I don't expect any more conferences like this. Uh, as, uh, of course, before then, especially, but any more the rest of this year. Yeah, outreach events are still evolving in, uh, through the um, late summer and fall time period, so we're still working to find those. Um, another plug for the website. Go to the website, look at the outreach event calendar. That's the, the sole source uh, for you being notified. Uh, it's, it's the best and most accurate. Uh, also. Uh, on the IVR, it's not the sole source. So on the I IVR, we also have an option for you to hear upcoming outreach events. So I encourage you to visit often. What type of organizations are considered plan sponsors? What types of organizations are considered plan sponsors? The plan sponsors uh, uh, generally uh, can be uh, employers, uh, both private employers, nonprofit employers. Uh, churches, uh, unions, uh, government, governmental plan. Uh, so uh, it's really basically uh, any organization that sponsors uh, employment-based uh, retiree prescription drug benefits. Can multiple designees submit retiree list files for one plan? If not, how do you expect sponsors with multiple vendors to submit the retiree list? Can multiple designees submit retiree list files for one plan? If not, how do you expect sponsors with multiple vendors to submit the retiree list? Um, <clears throat> the answer is we need to have, at this point in time, one file per application for your retiree list. If that is coming from separate vendors, you will have to find a way to uh, roll up those files into one and submit one file to the RDS center. Um, we'll certainly entertain other options in the future, but again, when I was going through the presentation, I mentioned that it's difficult for us to know if we had, um, if you had multiple files coming in, I'm not sure when I should process your retiree list. I won't know when I have the entire file without the plan sponsor's interaction or intervention. So at this point in time, um, you need to find a way to um, concatenate all of those files or collect all those files together and submit them in one, one file submission to the RDS Center. Plan sponsors need to submit the retiree list prior to September 30th, 2005. However, it is not effective until January 1, 2006. What function does the list serve if it is not reflective of the actual 2006 data? Plan sponsors need to submit the retiree list prior to September 30th, 2005. However, it is not effective until January 1, 2006. What function does the list serve if it is not reflective of the actual 2006 data? I guess there's a couple, couple pieces to that uh, question. And uh, perhaps, Mark, you could chime in uh, a little bit more uh, in support here. But I think uh, what the original intent was to pro provide as much feedback as soon as possible to plan sponsors so that they could begin planning um, uh, for what will be coming up in uh, coming months with respect to uh, file submission and potentially planning for how they track uh, on their end uh, payment information uh, per retiree. So that's, uh, that's one particular uh, reason, I guess. Uh, also, we, also we, we Medicare have the need to uh, get our databases updated uh, before the Medicare Part D open enrollment season begins so that again we can prevent possible, um, the unnecessary Part D enrollment for someone who already has a very robust retiree coverage. So those, those are two reasons. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, uh, just to supplement what Dave was saying, um, w the beneficiary angle is really one of the critical reasons for doing that. So this way we know 
before the open enrollment period uh, for beneficiaries who might be in a plan for which their employer is claiming a subsidy payment. And I, I, I can't recall if it's already been discussed today or not, but we have a system in place to try to provide these uh, checks uh, for an employer that is claiming a subsidy if an individual who uh, is one of the retirees is going to be signing up for Part D. We want to be able to notify the sponsor so that they can either make systems changes to reflect that fact or communicate with the retiree to let them know that you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing this or you may want to consider not doing that. They, you can't prevent them from doing that, but you could, if you wish to do this, speak with them. But that needs to be done far enough in advance of the open enrollment period, which starts in November 15th. So that was one of the prime motivations for trying to get all the employer uh, activity done in advance of the November 15th date. And, and again, that's with the acknowledgement that there will be changes and um, and, and to the extent that there are changes reflecting uh, for the next open enrollment period, then you'll submit those. But th I think from my perspective, that's one of the cri critical reasons why we uh, chose the September 30th date in the proposed reg and ended up sticking with it in the final rule. And, and just one, one last thing. I mean, it just the, the retiree population clearly uh, is not one that's extremely transient from option to option. So uh, that, I think our assumption there is that yeah, the data may not be perfect, but uh, it should be pretty good. Is VDSA available for all employers, regardless of size? Is VDS available for all employers, regardless of size? Um, the answer to that is yes, but is it, is it necessarily economical for a very, very small company to do to VDSA? That's something they would have to look at internally and decide for themselves. I mean, as we mentioned earlier, there is no charge whatsoever to do a VDSA. Uh, but I will mention again that there are other companies out there that actually offer to administer the VDSA on their behalf. And I've seen a lot of smaller companies making the decision to utilize some of these private consulting companies to provide that information as a service uh, just because it's easier. Uh, the VDSA file process, you know, it's, it's a little bit more complicated in terms of the amount of data that goes back and forth in the two different file formats. But, you know, based on the specifications in the agreement, you know, I would ask you to look at that and make that decision for yourself. But again, there are those other options out there. And there are, we have received a lot of contact uh, from more and more of these like healthcare data management type consulting companies that already, you know, take, a, take part in, in administering, you know, many, you know, smaller employers, especially their benefit programs. And this is an option for you all to consider as well. And then finally, I will mention uh, that uh, if the employer feels they cannot do it, they can also try to see if their insurer would enter into a VDSA directly with CMS to provide that data to us via that. And that's, again, we have about 50 agreements with you know, pretty much most, almost all of the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans as well as a lot of other uh, large insurers such as UHC, Aetna, Cigna, Kaiser, et cetera, so. How large a file or number of records can be handled by the HTTP upload file transfer method? How large a file or number of records can be handled by the HTTP upload file transfer method? We aren't setting any specific limits of retiree file records. Each individual record is rather small, so we're not, um, currently imposing any limitation on you. It, it will, of course, the larger the file, the longer it will take to upload, but we don't really um, think that any of you are going to create a file too large for us to handle. I guess we'll find out. At but. least not on purpose. Right. <laughs> will the group we uploading hope. the retiree lists be able to test the file transfer and file layout with CMS prior to live date? Will the group uploading the retiree lists be able to test the file transfer and file layout with CMS prior to the live date? We're actually testing um, with the VDSA uh, plan sponsors, of course, and the mainframe to mainframe file option. We will not be testing with um, the upload to the secure website. So in a sense, your test is is your production submission, and if you have a problem with that, um, you'll be contacted either through your 
um, notification or, you know, well, I, I would presume it would just be through your response file. Please reiterate what date should be used on the day of file titled coverage effective date. Is it really necessary to use an old date when retiree originally enrolled, or is the first day of the first plan year where a subsidy is claimed okay? Please reiterate what date should be used on the date of fi file titled coverage effective date. Is it really necessary to use an old date when retiree originally enrolled, or is it the first day of the first plan year where a subsidy is claimed okay? There are two, uh, two ways that field should be populated. The first is the retiree uh, was actually, has been in this plan, uh, and a new benefit year is starting. So option number one is that effective date would be day one of that particular plan year. The second way it could be populated is if a person, a uh, retiree, was not uh, in that plan at the beginning of the plan year, and then in a subsequent month, enrolls into that, that, uh, that plan, and that would be the effective date on that new ad record. So we are not asking for you to report the date way back in time, uh, however many years ago it was, that that retiree first selected that benefit. It's only for this particular plan year mapped to this particular application and account. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's important to remember that your application is for one plan year, so the, the plan year in question or the effective date should reflect that particular plan year for that particular application. And, and it will be resubmitted then next year when the plan year starts again. And just a, another corollary to that, for, for those plans that uh, plan on, uh, plans that plan, <laughs> plans that are going to submit an application for a plan year that ends in 2006 and the transition period applies, we're not asking you to, to do us a favor and put January 1 in there. We know when the, when the program is, uh, is starting uh, with respect to when payments begin, but we're asking that the effective date for those uh, retirees that are in the plan, perhaps starting in 2005, which then ends in 2006, to actually give us that 2005 effective date. Again, it's either the first day of that plan or uh, for that benefit year or the first date in which that specific retiree is enrolled under that plan, even if it is in 2005. We'll do the math. We'll figure it out. Right. Th this is the plan that operates on a, on a fiscal year basis other than a calendar year. Can an employer group who successfully applied for RDS change mid-plan year to an MA Part D plan? Can an employer group who successfully applied for RDS change mid-plan year to an MA Part D plan? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, you can have a sponsor um, successfully apply for the subsidy and then partway through the plan year decide that, that for whatever reason they want to switch to another option, they would just stop following uh, the cost data for the subsidy, notify the RDS Center that they're no longer going to participate in the subsidy program, and then they they would be free to pursue uh, another option for employers such as uh, sponsoring a PDP plan, a Part D plan for the retirees, or supplementing Part D. And in that notification to the RDS Center, we would expect to have a specific date when that would become effective, and uh, that would be the last day, basically, that uh, employees, or excuse me, retirees could be covered under that plan for RDS purposes. Now, uh, that employer would still have to go through the reconciliation process at the end of the, of the plan year to reconcile the interim payment that they did receive. Uh, so the real participation in the RDS program would not be final until that reconciliation. So I assume in that situation, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, but once we receive that notification, we would be sending uh, a subsidy update record file for, to them, so indicating that term date. Or I'm not sure what you thought about. Can you give me the scenario again? I'm not well, sure if, I... if, uh, if, a, if a plan decides that um, they are going to become an MA plan, in other words, they're not going to be seeking a retiree drug subsidy um, in the middle of their plan year, um, they would have to notify the RDS Center uh, 
uh, of when that last date is, when they're going to transition to be a MA plan. So as long as we have the date and we know when that plan is going to be um, not seeking subsidy payments anymore, would we send them a file indicating that you know the subsidy uh, term date with this updated subsidy term dates for all the retirees that uh, they've been claiming for RDS. I'm not sure we've thought this all the way through. I, I, I'm question. not sure either. I was expecting that I would get um, an update retiree date. file from the plan sponsor with termination dates for all of the retirees affected. That would certainly be more in line with our processes, so. Sounds like another JAD session coming <laughs> up. So. Well, that's how we do it in BDSA. <laughs> <laughs> what format will the response file from CMS be sent? How often will there be discrepancy reports from CMS? What format will the response file from CMS be sent in? How often will there be discrepancy reports from CMS? Um, I'll take this question. You, the, could I actually hold that question for a minute just to <laughs> make sure that I see? That I wrote um, right. <laughs> the actual file formats, I discussed the, um, the data elements earlier today, so they're in your presentation materials. Um, however, we will post the file layouts on Friday um, that will be more specific. They'll, they're the file layouts that you will submit for your retiree file and then also the response file layout that you'll receive back. Um, you, every time you send us a file, um, if you send us a monthly um, retiree list, you will get a response back, one response file back. Um, we will also be um, providing on that file error messages, um, codes, um, the, the um, reason codes to explain why the record might have been um, rejected by the RDS Center or not. Um, so the, the frequency of your response file is as you send it to us. I think that pretty much covers okay. Great, thank you. Will the BDSA process help with getting member, spouse, beneficiary social security numbers? Employees are having a difficult time getting this information. Will the BDSA process help with getting member, spouse, beneficiary social security numbers? Employers are having a difficult time getting this information. Uh, unfortunately, unless you have an HIC uh, number, uh, you're not gonna be able to Develop for the SSN, um, and you know, I mean, that's that's you know, to guard guard beneficiaries' privacy because we can't we can't just simply take in a, a name, date of birth, uh, you know, and sex of an individual and find a social security. I mean, there's how many John Smiths out there? We need to ensure. Th I mean, that's part of the validation process to make sure that you're telling us about who you think you're telling us about it, and that's what the SSN is used with those personal characteristics to, to validate that data. So unfortunately, without an SSN, I don't think any of these processes will work, so. Okay, this is a um, two-part question, and I'm going to take it part by part for you, I think. If one of our retirees attempts to enroll in a Medicare Part D plan, but is not reported on our retiree drug subsidy eligibility list, Will the retiree be rejected from, for the PDP until they disenroll in our retiree medical plan? If one of our retirees attempts to enroll in a Medicare Part D plan, but is reported on our retiree drug subsidy ed eligibility list, will the retiree be rejected for the PDP until they disenroll in our retiree medical plan? I'll take that question. Um, as Mark uh, indicated uh, earlier, uh, we have set up a, uh, a sort of a, a, a different system for those in, uh, uh, Medicare beneficiaries that have been flagged for the retiree drug subsidy and, that, and they attempt to enroll in Part D. And that is, if they uh, sign up with the PDP plan and they've already been counted for the subsidy with uh, another employer, when that PDP or MAPD plan send the retiree or the beneficiary's name back to CMS to check against the database, uh, that person would have been flagged for the subsidy, and that uh, enrollment into the PDP will be nullified. 
and then the RDS center would be notified, and who in turn would notify the employer, uh, uh, the sponsor of what the uh, of the plan, what the beneficiary has already enrolled, and the employer would have an opportunity to contact the beneficiary and make sure that um, they know what the ramifications are. That the and it would be up to the employer to decide what would happen if the beneficiary enrolled in Part D and be in accordance with the plan document. Either the em employer could allow their plan to go secondary or they could terminate their coverage if the person enrolls in Part D. And then after the employer contacts the beneficiary, the beneficiary subsequently contact the PDMCP and say that they still want to enroll in Part D, even despite getting all that information, then the enrollment will go through. And then uh, that person will be enrolled in Part D. And then, again, it would be up to the employer's plan documents as to what would happen to the employer's plan at that point. And a second part to that, but I believe you answered, is if not, will our retiree medical plan be allowed to pay as secondary to PDP as we do for Medicare's Part A and B? If not, will our retiree medical plan be allowed to pay as secondary to PDP as we do for Medicare Part A and B? Absolutely. If the employer chooses to supplement uh, the benefit for those people who enroll in Part D, that's certainly their option. Uh, they can choose to do that or they could choose to uh, terminate the coverage. And, and just to supplement that a little bit more, we have been working extremely hard with uh, stakeholders involved in the, in the, in the process, uh, claims payers, secondary payers, pharmacists, and so on, in ensuring that effective 1106, there is in fact going to be a coordination of benefits system in place that will allow both Medicare Part D plans, secondary payers like employers to coordinate uh, in real time, point of sale at the pharmacy so that the claims are appropriately paid um, and, and the primary payer, the Part D plan, pays appropriately and the employer plan, the secondary payer, pays appropriately. So we believe that employers that choose to, to take this option, and I'm hopeful that even those who take the subsidy, if you do have somebody who signs up for Part D, you do choose to agree to be a secondary payer. If you take this approach, there is going to be a very workable coordination of benefit system in place to allow that to take place. Can different designees have different methods for communicating monthly retire list submission updates, or does the retiree list submission always come from the account manager? Can different designees have different methods for communicating monthly retiree list submission updates, or does the retiree list submission always come from the account manager? Um, the retiree list does not have to come from the account manager. However, the submission method is based on what you've chosen on your application. So there's one file transfer method um, per application, and, and that's what's important. So if you have multiple designees who might be able to upload files for you at different times, um, they must all, for a, one particular application, they must use the same file transfer method at this time. Is plan description referring to the actual carrier, for example, Blue Cross um, Health Plan, is plan description referring to the actual carrier or for example, Blue Cross Health Plan. I think, again, we've given the flexibility for you to define what it is you put in that field. It has to be a meaningful description for you. Uh, again, if you're an account manager and you're involved with helping multiple plan sponsors manage uh, their interactions with the RDS Center, uh, that would be a much more meaningful data element. If you're presented a list of plan sponsors or applications on the screen, you'll be able to see which one, rather than memorizing a series of application numbers or plan sponsor IDs, that field is meant to, to be a more easy qualifying, uh, sorry, uh, uh, word I'm looking for, a more easy descriptor for you to understand as you're interacting with the RDS website. How is an account manager or authorized representative or designee to be terminated? How is an account manager or authorized representative or designee to be terminated? 
There is a feature on the uh, secure website where the authorized rep can go in and actually um, terminate, uh, <laughs> so to speak, um, add an expiration date to the account manager to remove them um, from their account. Um, if they're not valid for any other plan sponsor accounts, actually their ID will be revoked in that case. Um, the same goes, there is a, an update feature where an account manager can change their authorized rep on a particular plan sponsor account. And then application by application, you can go in and um, fill in or complete the expiration date for a designee. I didn't show you that functionality um, today, but it, it will exist on the secure website, so you'll have control over um, those designees and account manager and authorized reps associated with your account. I heard that we can send our entire enrollment file to check Medicare eligibility, for example, to find disabled Medicare eligibles on the retiree list. Is that true? I heard that we can send our entire enrollment file to check Medicare eligibility, for example, to find disabled Medicare eligibles on the retiree list. Is that true? Uh, that sounds like a, a VDSA question. The answer is yes. Um, we pass back uh, entitlement information, including reason for entitlement, so disability is one of them. So, I don't know if, you know. Well, if, 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 if the plan sponsor submits um, a list of ad records uh, at the point when they're s submitting their application, we will give a response, um, but we will not be identifying through the regular secure RDS website file transfer process, we will not be passing back to you um, information that would allow you to know that that person was entitled to Medicare because of disability. We are passing back the minimum amount of information as is necessary to determine a subsidy period for that person and whether or not it's a qualifying covered retiree. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the difference is through a VDSA, you will get entitlement dates um, and information back and the health insurance uh, claim number that we were discussing before. If you are submitting retiree files directly to RDS and not through VDSA, uh, the only response that you will get is whether um, your retiree is eligible for the subsidy. Um, by default, they must be entitled for or eligible for Medicare. Um, however, we will not pass you back the health insurance claim number unless you gave it to us and we won't pass back any entitlement or eligibility dates um, through that process. Is the mailing address for the AM personal information the business address or the home address? Is the mailing address for the AM personal information the business address or the home address? Um, we're expecting a business address. Will you release the scripts and Q&As that your call center uses on RDS and COB? Will you release the scripts and Q&As that your call center uses on RDS and COB? For the, web, for the RDS website, uh, we are planning on loading a, a number of frequently asked questions, questions that have been submitted here today and tomorrow during this conference and at other times uh, over recent months. Uh, we have a long list of questions right now that we're putting the finishing touches on. So hopefully on our, on our uh, FAQ page on the RDS Center website, you'll be seeing a, a pretty robust list of, of FAQs very, very soon. How about COB? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, whatever we want to be able to put as much on the web as possible rather than provide things like scripts because, again, those, would, those are subject to change and the websites always are updated. So. Uh, you know, same thing, I mean, we would refer people to the COB website as well for information for employers and insurers about the various processes that we handle. You refer to Part A entitled and Part B enrolled. Can you please clarify the definitions of entitled, enrolled, and eligible? You refer to Part A entitled and Part B enrolled. Can you please clarify the definitions of entitled, enrolled, and eligible? Uh, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, <clears throat> for Medicare Part A, under the statute, entitlement means somebody who is actually in um, 
part A. And, and I think one of the reasons perhaps they don't use the phrase enrolled is that for many people, when you sign up for Social Security, you're automatically put into Medicare Part A. So there isn't really, while you're signing up for your Social Security benefits, there really isn't a, a, a second act that's needed to get your Medicare Part A benefit. But in the Part A world, entitlement means you're actually getting the Part A benefit. Enrolled is, is a phrase they use in Part B. In Part B, you pay for the benefit and you actually have to physically enroll in it. Eligible is, uh, is something I think we typically use in the Medicare Part D world, which is somebody who is either entitled to Part A or enrolled in Part B. And if you're entitled in, to Part A or enrolled in Part B, then you are eligible to pick Part D. If you enroll, thank you. And if you pick, so if you pick Part D, <laughs> I'm on a roll now. If you pick, if you actually enroll in Part D, then you're enrolled in Part D. If you don't, so you're still eligible for it, then your sponsor can choose the subsidy payment. Thank you and good night. <laughs> uh, this is John. I, I can add a little words of wisdom that uh, someone told me years ago. And then, I mean, people don't always use the, the words correctly, but generally think of it alphabetically. You're eligible, you enroll, you become entitled. That's kind of you know, what's passed around often at CMS. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the B and the D, I guess you become enrolled in it, uh, but the Medicare Part A is an entitlement, as Mark said. But for in some cases, though, I mean, you actually become eligible for Part A three months prior to when you can become entitled to it. So it's eligible, enroll, which is automatic for Part A, uh, and you become entitled. Entitlement is when you're actually taking the benefit. <laughs> And our last question for the day, <laughs> wait, wait, in writing, is are people in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and the territories eligible for subsidy? Are the people in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and the territories eligible for subsidy? Good question. Uh, tip -tip. <laughs> <laughs> tip -tip yes. <laughs> yes, since they're part of the United States, uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're entitled to Medicare benefits. Oh, entitled, eligible, whatever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're in Medicare, so yes, the same rules apply there. OK. First of all, thank you to this panel. You did an exceptionally good job, and thank you. And to all of you, those questions were, were wonderful. As you can see, we have lots of them. Tomorrow, we will address the questions from tomorrow's session at the end of the day. Uh, some closing announcements. If you are an, a speaker tomorrow, please meet in the speaker ready room no later than 8 o'clock tomorrow morning so that you can uh, have your morning briefing and we can get you hooked up to microphones, etc. There have been several requests for informal regional meetings. And we have tried to determine whether that is possible so that you can have some networking time. As of the break, we are still waiting to see if all of the regional people will be here, because the recommendation is that if you want to take the time to network, that we do it between 7 and 8 in the morning. And what we would do is set up sections of the room, and we would have them posted. Unfortunately, they have not confirmed this back to me. But I probably had close to 100 of you asking if that's possible. So I do not know the answer. The best that I can tell you is that if it's going to happen, um, look for a sign outside this door sometime between tonight and tomorrow morning. And we will let you know if it's going to happen. Uh, it won't happen before 7 a.m., but what we would do is uh, we have six regions. We would put five regions, one, one per section, and one out in the common area. So look for that posting. That's all I can tell you at the moment. We have had questions about checkout tomorrow for those of you that may be leaving on flights after the end of the day. We encourage you to use Express Checkout. We are not the only conference here in the hotel. 
The other thing is, can you bring luggage into this room? I would discourage you from doing that. Number one, there's just not enough room. And number two, when we go out for breaks and things, this is not a secure area. So I would discourage you. I would say, take it to the bell stand and do it there. The other thing was, are there organized dinners tonight? Only if you organize them. <laughs> And with that, I thank all of you, particularly our signers who have done an incredibly good job. And I see a hand, yes. Yeah, this is John. Um, unfortunately, those of us from the COB team are leaving early tomorrow morning, and I said I would stick around if people have any other additional questions they want to ask me at the end of the presentation, which is now. So I'll just remain up here for anybody who has additional questions or whatnot. Excellent. Thank you very much. We are adjourned until 8.30 tomorrow morning. Say